So we just go for that one. Oh, there's a bell. Where you go? <laughs> and if it becomes a horn, then we're really in trouble. So you're sitting through it second time, Dave. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I'm going to... Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's certainly six o'clock, so I think we should start, yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, first, first to say thank you very much for coming and welcome to the Geological Society. Uh, this is the first of the public lectures of the year and, of course, of the decade, so uh, hopefully it will be an absolutely premier lecture. Um, first of all, a bit of housekeeping. The, uh, if, if in, there is any emergency, and we're not expecting one, so if any alarms start to, to rattle, then we need to get out. Through the curtain there, there's a door that takes you out into the courtyard of, uh, in front of the Royal Academy. There are three doors at the back, and you can get out the main road uh, through Piccadilly onto Piccadilly, stay on the pavement, come around, and we, we would meet in the, uh, or muster in the uh, Academy courtyard there. So that's the, uh, that's the way out. I'm sure the bathroom's around the corner here if you've, if you've, uh, if you've any need of those in an in an urgent, in a urgent sort of way in the next 50 minutes. Um, and I think that's, that's the housekeeping. I still have one or two people popping in, but uh, I think I'll just keep going here. Uh, so this is also the start of a new theme for the society. So every year the society has these themes. And this year the theme is, is life. And uh, we'll be exploring through the, through the year uh, the, the unique attributes of our unique planets. I mean, it's, it's becoming constant, or it's still very clear that we are the only planet with life that we're really aware of uh, so far. And what's the th What's going to happen is we're going to be exploring what are these unique attributes of the planet that make Earth what it is and have shaped the Earth to give us life. But also, what is the impact life has had on the planet? And of course, that is tremendously topical at the moment. Uh, today we have Nick Rogers, who will discuss how water and plate tectonics uh, have combined... To, to create this habitable planet of ours and how the cycling of that water through the mantle, through the lithosphere, into the deep mantle and back um, have shaped the planet and its people, ourselves. So that's uh, a real big story that's going to emerge as, uh, as Nick uh, talks to us, I'm sure. Nick is an emeritus professor at the Open University and he ran the Trace Element Lab there uh, for many years and his research has been very much in alkaline volcanism and the mantle. And so the right person to have us talking to us about water that uh, gets cycled. Nick is currently president of the society and has been chair of the 
uh, Education Group and, uh, and the Publications uh, Secretary. So welcome, Nick, and I hope you enjoy the next 50 or so minutes of the program. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Um, Mike Daly, by the way, is president-designate, so he takes over from me in six months' time, and in about 12 months' time, he'll be doing this. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think I told him that when I tried to persuade him to stand. <laughs> but anyway, let's uh, move on. Anyway, how and why the Earth is different. I was hauled up by a fellow Radio 4 listener this afternoon um, saying, different from what? Um, and I said, well, I felt it was uh, perfectly correct to be non-grammatical for a title, uh, to leave it rather open. Anyway, how and why the Earth is different. And uh, let's move on. Th this um, image that I've used is quite a, is just one of the almost infinite number of images that NASA have produced of both the Earth and of various planets uh, and, and objects in the, in the solar system over the years. And it, it, it just beautifully illustrates the Earth as it is today, uh, continents and oceans, swirling clouds, and uh, you, can just, you can just see on the limb there just how thin the atmosphere is. I mean, th this, this, is the, uh, this is the protective layer that sustains us and keeps us going. And uh, I, I've, while, it, while this is a very beautiful image, it also makes me feel that Earth is particularly vulnerable, or at least to the surface of the Earth. But the Earth has a, a number of um, unique, unique features, and uh, obviously we have life on Earth. And uh, as Mike said in his introduction, um, uh, we know of no other planets, no other place in the solar system in the universe where, where life exists. I mean, that doesn't rule out the possibilities that it does, but this is the only place that we know where life exists uh, and, and where life can continue. And uh, as much as Elon Musk might want to drive his, uh, his, his, his cars to Mars, I, I wish him luck. Um, as, as you will see uh, as this talk regresses. Um, oh, I should, I should have said at the beginning, this, this is not really about my research. It's, uh, this, this work resulted from sort of some scholarship research that I needed to do for teaching at the Open University, trying to understand the Earth working as a system. And what I've, I've first, I first put it together over 10 years ago, and I brought it up to date with, um, uh, with more recent uh, work in, in the literature uh, over, the par over the past f uh, sort of decade or so. So some of, some of the references are quite, quite old, um, 10, uh, 20, 30 years ago, but actually they, they are, lay the foundations for the work of, uh, of, of what is going on at the moment. Anyway, back to Earth's unique features. Oceans and continents are quite a, a special feature of the Earth. I mean, it is at the interaction of the oceans and dry land that provides the most, uh, the most dynamic environments where, where, uh, where life develops, life has evolved, and life continues today. Just think of the Barrier Reef in Australia. That is, uh, in, in that really, the, 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 the sweet spot of the habitable, habitable zone of our planet. We have an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which is the result of life. Uh, with no life, there would be no free oxygen in the atmosphere. Oxygen is out of equilibrium with the chemistry of the Earth, and it, it is maintained, maintained by life. Uh, we also have a magnetic field. Uh, about which I shall say virtually nothing. Um, but the, what, you see, what, what you see on, on, this, uh, on this image are, the, are the, the oceans and the clouds, weather systems, and so forth. And these are driven largely by energy from the sun. And we understand these in terms of the global cycles, the carbon cycle, about which there is a lot in the papers these days. Uh, there's also the water cycle, about which there will be a lot in the papers soon, because water is a very critical, and as I shall show you, very limited resource on the planet. And then there's the rock cycle, which we geologists just love to bits, um, but, which is basically dependent on, well, the carbon cycle, which part, plays an important part in the carbon cycle and the water cycle. And we know these dynamic cycles really dominate the surface processes of the Earth. But what goes on inside the Earth? Uh, if we strip away the oceans and the atmosphere, we'll ignore them because they're very vulnerable and we've just taken them away in a godlike fashion. 
uh, we, can see, and we can see the topography of the planet. And this, although the oceans are still blue and the, pla and the, and the continents are sort of browny green colors, these are color coded in terms of elevation. So the deeper the blue, the deeper the, deeper the, uh, the depression in the surface, and the browner, the browner the color, the higher the elevation. And then in the Himalayas, of course, it, it, goes, it goes gray there. So what we, what we see when we strip away the oceans are the strong linear features, such as the ocean ridges that form this 60,000 kilometer continuous chain uh, right through, th through, the, uh, through the ocean basins where, where the plates are created at constructive plate margins, and then we, which is a very a globe encircling linear feature. We also see these deep ocean trenches adjacent to continental regions, but also in, in, this, part of, in this part of the Western Pacific, a jumble of trenches and islands, uh, such as the Marianas there, where the ocean, the ocean plates are subducted. And then in other places, like a crook, and this is a particularly good example in the uh, very southern Pacific, are these uh, offsets in the ridges, the transform faults, which are conservative plate boundaries. And the question, and the, these are really the products of plate tectonics. On the, and on the continents, of course, we, get, we have linear mountain chains. So plate tectonics produces linear features on the surface of the Earth. Now, not all features on that are linear, but, but they, they are quite characteristic of the plate tectonic process. Now, do we see that on any of the other planets? So, just as plate tectonics, the way the Earth loses its internal energy, dominated by linear features. The main features are in the ocean basins, in the lowland areas, and that's to bear in mind when looking at other, other planetary bodies. Some features are in the continental highlands, such as mountain chains, are also linear. Do we see these features on other planets? So the next bit of the talk is a sort of a, a, a Cook's tour through the, the inner solar system. Um, Brian Cox did a wonderful TV series about this. Um, and I can't do his accent, and I don't have his charisma. Um, but I do have a better understanding, I think, of the way <laughs> some planets work. Uh, so. Let's, uh, let's move on from there. <laughs> anyway, the solar system has rocky planets and gas giants. Uh, and they're beautifully illustrated in this NASA montage, which gives an impression that the solar system is a very cosy, neighborly sort of place. Um, it isn't. Uh, and I like this image is uh, a much, um, I think, just to philosophically to take away the vastness of space. Um, this is the... This is sort of a rear view mirror image taken from a space probe heading for the sun. Um, it's the Earth and the Moon from I don't know what sort of distance, but, uh, that's, but they're a quarter of a million uh, kilometers or whatever it is apart, which is just nothing in space. Uh, and there's, um, I think that, that really puts the truth to the Douglas Adams quote at the bottom there from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It is. Um, Space is pretty big, and, and, uh, and I do find the trip to the chemist getting increasingly long, I know, as I grow older, but, uh, uh, but the trip to the moon would be very long. Anyway, um, anyway, back to the solar system, this image. Uh, rocky planets and gas giants. The gas giants are of absolutely no use to us here at all. All you can see on a gas giant uh, are the dynamics of the atmosphere. You can see the chemistry of the atmosphere, you can see the weather, you can see the strength of the winds, and it's all fascinating and really deeply interesting if you're an atmospheric physicist or a meteorologist uh, or something like that. But as a geologist, um, we go to sleep as soon as you get past Jupiter's big red spot. Uh, so this, this, what I'm going to focus on here are the rocky planets of the inner solar system and the moon. And uh, let's kick off with the moon, which is just such a wonderfully familiar image. F f to us, I mean that's a, a nice full moon, super moon, I believe it's called regularly these days, and we know that the moon is dominated by impact structures, some of which are relatively young. Others, and if you follow that round there, this is one of the big impacts from the from the lunar maria, the so-called seas, which are in fact plains of basaltic volcanic rock that were produced during giant impacts uh, on the moon approximately 
uh, 4,000 million years ago. The highland areas, which are paler in colour here, are deeply cratered, deeply fractured. And we know because those few people have been to the moon, and one of them was even a geologist, uh, and they brought some samples back, and far better geochemists than I have been working on them for, uh, for the decades since. And believe it, there are, still, there are still packets of samples from the lunar program that have yet to be unwrapped. So there's still treasure awaiting us. But anyway, the results from that show that the, um, the highlands are almost as old as the solar system. They're about 4.2 to 4.2 to 4.4 billion years old in terms of, their, of, of their, the age of that surface, and you get that from the cratering record and also direct radiometric dating. And the lunar maria are somewhat younger, but still no, no younger than about 3.9 billion years. So this is a very old, um, this is a very old surface, and it, and it reflects. It reflects the violence of the processes going on in the early solar system and the heat involved in producing objects like the moon and the earth. So its surface is dominated by impacts. There's no, there's no indication on there of linear, linear features, apart from the square I've just superimposed on it, any uh, linear, linear features that look like ridges or trenches or transform faults. It's been geologically inactive for almost 4 billion years, 4,000 million years. Uh, it lost its heat early in its history, and, it, uh, and the amount of radioactive heat it produces from the inside is readily radiated from the surface. And therefore, in effect, it's too small to sustain a dynamically, tectonically active interior. Uh, Mercury is our next port of call, uh, largely because it's the next biggest thing. And the story there is very similar. When I first put this talk together, uh, these, this was probably one of the better images from a spacecraft of Mercury, rather just seeing it in, in its, uh, uh, um, like, a, like a sort of a crescent moon. Um, and now we have images like this, uh, which should... Oh, look at that, it worked. Um, this is the result of the Mercury NASA messenger uh, probe sent to the moon, and this was put together by... Uh, a team at John Hopkins and NASA and various other universities and is readily available on the web. And it just, whoops, and uh, let's go back and set it off again. Um, but it shows, you can see, once again, the features on there are largely circular. There are some sort of linear striations on there. Some of them are artifacts of putting the whole thing together. Uh, but, uh, and the colours are false colours reflecting the composition of the various areas. But, it's, uh, but essentially, it looks like the moon, and it's very similar to the moon. It's small, dominated by impacts, and probably inactive. There are some of the striations, some of the lineations on the moon, on, the, on Mercury, sorry, uh, do reflect uh, what's called contraction tectonics. In other words, as, as the moon cools and it sets, so it, then it shrinks. And as it shrinks, the rigid crust has to accommodate that shrinkage and it pushes, and pushes together and there are small thrust faults that uh, have been identified. But generally speaking, there's no, there's no evidence for serious tectonic activity. Then we move on to Mars. And Mars is the great hope for life, life elsewhere. Um, and so has been the subject of an enormous amount of study over the past years. Uh, including from some of my colleagues from the Open University, and uh, they've been involved in well, been involved in missions to Mars and various other things. So, so some of this is cobbled from them. Uh, when we look at that, there is this. This is the one of the the hemispheres of Mars, and it shows this fantastic rift structure that goes around about a, nearly a third of the planet, the Valles Marineris, uh, and is. Um, on certainly the similar lengths to the African Rift, uh, but much more dramatic, much deeper, and with much higher rims. And then around, just on the, the limb of this, uh, of this hemisphere, you can see the, uh, the volcanic cones of the Tharsis region. So there is clearly some sense of internal activity uh, on Mars that we might relate to, um, to its internal heat, uh, and therefore similar to Earth. Uh, these are two images of the um, um, uh, Olympus Mons, the, uh, the biggest volcano in the, uh, 
in the solar system. I nearly said universe there, but I didn't know that. Uh, certainly, it is an enormous structure, about twice, twice, the, twice the height of Hawaii from its floor, and, uh, and goodness knows how many times larger in, in diameter. Um, it, it is an enormous, enormous structure, but it looks remarkably terrestrial. I mean, any geologist will recognize sort of nest, nested, uh, nested craters in here, and this is a close-up of those structures. And this, this, all this looks really very familiar to us, although we might not see a fresh impact crater like that uh, next to one on Earth. And looking at the, but looking in detail, well, you can't see them, the, the cratering record of these surfaces suggest that the volcanism was active uh, in what we would call the Mesozoic 100 to 200 million years ago. And this is a further montage of some of the images that we've got back from Mars. This is, I think, from the Mar Mars Orb Orbiter, and, uh, and just a straight-down aerial view of uh, Aeolian erosion, which could be, you could find that in any desert on Earth. Uh, this interesting image here from the same paper that dated the volcanism uh, has been interpreted as uh, the, the caused by the movement of pack ice. And it looks, if you look at those shapes, they do look remarkably similar to images you can see of pack ice in the Arctic or the Antarctic. The idea being that there was a shallow, a, a shallow sea or lake that, which froze, then a volcanic eruption dropped or a sandstorm deposited sediment on the top the ice and the, the, the water then evaporated and the ice sublimed and left that pattern in the surface. And then at the bottom left hand, oh, sorry, bottom left hand corner here uh, are two examples uh, of, of, well, this is an image from the uh, Opportunity rover that is um, currently, still currently sending back images from uh, Gale Crater. Uh, and it's, as you can see, scale bar, one centimetre here. So similar size to this on Earth. And these, these are, I think, gypsum, gypsum uh, veins in a, in a desert deposit on Earth. And these are looking very similar to something on Mars. So there's a strong evidence that the rock cycle and, a, and at times, a, a hydrological cycle are working, are, have, are working on Mars. And then I just put this one in really... There's a gratuitous one. This, is, this again, is from the, uh, one of the, the, the rover currently trundling its way um, through uh, Gale Crater uh, and looking up to Mount Sharp in the middle. And, and again, this is a scene you could... That could be Afghanistan or the Western US or somewhere like that on Earth. It's a very terrestrial-looking environment. And, we, and from, from uh, remote sensing, they know that there are clays in here uh, sand, sandstones and some volcanic rocks, and it looks, it's a very terrestrial feel to it. But when we look on the, on the planetary, on the global scale, and look at the, the variation in surface elevation, we can see that uh, it, it, it doesn't tell a very terrestrial story. <clears throat> there are linear features, as I pointed out, but mostly, and this is on, on this hemisphere, the uplands are very heavily cratered. This is beginning to still look very much like Mercury or the Moon. This is a very old Archean or even Hadean surface, evidence of a, of a large impact here. Uh, and then this area, this hemisphere, has been resurfaced. And then on the geolog what we might call the geologically active hemisphere, then these three, these three or four large volcanic structures going up to enormous heights uh, and 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 the, uh, the 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 rift there, but no real sense of anything going on in the lowlands. No constructed plate margins. No ocean trenches. Nothing that really remotely resembles plate tectonics. So Mars, twice the size of Mercury. Uh, we have clear evidence of Earth-like geological activity. Uh, the large volcanoes, um, periodically active hydrosphere, but we don't know how long ago, and that's one of the really big questions of these Mars missions, is how long ago the hydrosphere was active. And that, I think, either is going to involve some extremely clever work on, uh, on Martian meteorites, of which we have a handful, uh, or it's going to require act uh, sample, sample return missions. So I doubt I'll see them, but it'd be interesting to know what happens. 
Anyway, the crater record shows an old highland surface, but there is no real evidence for plate tectonics. So the last one, Venus. Um, Venus is nearly the same size as the Earth, so you might expect that it's got a similar composition. It's not very far from us. It's my nearest neighbor to, into the sun. But its, it's appearance, uh, when we see it through a telescope, or this one um, from an orbiting uh, space probe, from the, uh, the, Japanese, the Japanese have a probe up there at the moment. Uh, and this is it through uh, selected filtered ultraviolet camera uh, superimposed on the visible. And you, all you can see is the cloud structure. And we know those clouds are dominated by sulfuric acid and sulfur dioxide. And the atmosphere is dominated by, um, dominated by CO2. And the atmospheric pressure on Venus is about 98 bars, 98 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. Uh, in the 1980s, there was the Magellan mission, uh, which, sent, uh, which probed the surface of, the, of, of Venus using radar. And, uh, they pre and they've rather, rather um, I think, emotively uh, displayed it in shades of red, simply because the surface is so hot. Uh, that they like to do. I mean, it was, it we'll come on to a more, less emotively uh, coloured image at the moment, but this is the standard one. And this is just uh, lighter colours are highly reflected surfaces and the darker colours are less reflective. And, the high, and in terms of radar, if the surface is highly reflected, it means it's highly fractured, very rough. So there is this sense of rough terrain through here and uh, smoother terrain either side of it. Now, you could argue this is a linear feature, but uh, it doesn't look like any of the features I think we see on Earth. Uh, when you take close-ups of the Venusian surface, um, you can see uh, in this top left, the structures look remarkably like faults uh, uh, or maybe, maybe dipping sedimentary units. I think the, the evidence is that they are uh, faults of some sort. Uh, and then this fantastic image of a lava flow coming out of a volcanic crater. I'm not sure of the scale of this, but that's the sort of image, certainly in different colors, that you, that you would see in Hawaii, Iceland, somewhere that, is act, that has basaltic volcanism active today on Earth. And then there, there, are, other, there are other structures that are, I think these, these are um, tens of kilometers across, which look maybe like upwelling of material from deeper within the planet. Uh, perhaps diapyric action um, of uh, in, intruding volcanic rocks, but uh, I'm, I'm, that I think is that's not really certain. But anyway, there are there's certainly there's certainly evidence that the, that the planet is geologically active. When you have, as I say, less emotive colours and uh, and you colour code the um, the topography of the planet in the same way as we did for Earth and the others. Uh, the blue colors, blue colors are lowland areas, red and whites are high areas. You can see that there, there's, well, certainly in the lowland areas, there's no sense of any strong linear structures at all. Um, but there are over here, and these, these sort of arcuate features and linear features here, and in particular this one, this is the Artemis corona, uh, has been subject of recent investigation since I first put this talk together some years ago, and this is really quite an interesting result. Um, and this was published in Nature Geoscience in 2017. And this is an image, again, color-coded for elevation. So there is this, the, the art of the corona is a deep trench round here in an arcuate form. And the section B, B is dashed is across here. This is elevation versus distance. Notice this is only 2.5 kilometers and vertical scale, and this is 700 kilometers over here. So you have, to, you have to stretch that diagram out an enormous amount. But the authors noted the similarity in the profile of this trench to, um, to the uh, subduction zone or the, the, the deep trench around the Aleutian Islands in the Northern Pacific. And it was suggested that locally some form of subduction was going on in this. This, this, uh, this pit was being pushed underneath that bit this plate under that plate. However, the structures behind the arc, and this, as you can see, this is on a scale of 500 to 1,000 kilometers. This is a couple of thousand kilometers across, which is the same sort of scale that you see in, uh, in, in island arcs on Earth. 
but it's but the the interesting thing is that what's happening inside here is that this all appears to be upwelling and it and that on that sort of scale will be associated with mantle plume like activity on earth uh, and so the jury's out at the moment, but, there is, but there's a, a sort of an interesting perspective that Venus does have active tectonics going on it with some aspects that are comparable with plate tectonics, but not in the globe in, encircling uh, sort of range of plate boundaries that we see on Earth. So summarising our, our trip around the solar system, has Mercury with little evidence for continuing tectonic or geological activity. Mars has evidence for Earth-like geological surface processes, but internal activity is less prevalent. It, it does happen, it's, but it, it doesn't produce plate tectonics. Venus is probably tectonically active, but the style is very different. Also, all have highlands and lowlands, but are they analogous to continents and oceans? Uh, and I suggest that they're not. And the reason for that is when you look at the hips, what are called the hypsometric profiles for the planets. And these are simply histograms of the elevation of the surface above the mean elevation, okay, uh, plotted, and that this is the percentage. So on Venus, we have a very tight distribution of elevation. 90% of, of the territory is plus or minus two kilometers around that zero mean elevation. On Mars, we also have a sort of a, a broader, we have, well, we have a much broader distribution, which goes from minus four up to plus 10. That's the top of Olympus Mons, and that's the bottom of the Valles Marineris. But that has this, broadly speaking, it's still a smooth unimodal distribution. On Earth, we have a bimodal distribution. And the this, this essentially represents, this is the continent, so to put it briefly, and these, and these are the ocean basins. And most, most of the Earth is in the ocean basins and a small amount in the continents. And the reason for this on Earth is that the surface is in what we call isostatic equilibrium. The continents are made of light materials like granites, and they float at a higher level in the mantle than the oceanic lithosphere, which is dominantly made of basalt and gabbro, much denser rocks. So this, this bimodal distribution represents a contrast in the dominant composition, granite versus basalt. We don't see that on Venus. We certainly don't see that on Mars. So I would suggest that the, the lack of the bimodal distribution on both Venus and Mars means that there is no distinct continental crust. No, the, the, the crust is, is a variable composition, but, over, but, but, smooth, but smoothly variable rather than bimodal. And, the, and it, could be, it could be that the, the, the lack of this profile on Mars implies either a lack of isostatic compensation on Mars or a lack of composi compositionally distinct crust. And I think that happens on Venus. Venus should have, well, with that that very sharp profile suggests that the crust, the lithosphere on Venus is in isostatic equilibrium. Uh, that on Mars isn't. But, the, but I think the take home message is there are no continents and oceans on those two large planets. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I shall take a drink while you read the summary. And the important thing for us on Earth is that surface water provides a sink for carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide, the dominant gases that come out of volcanoes. If, if they didn't dissolve in water, they would just fill up the atmosphere, and that partly is why Venus has such a thick and toxic atmosphere, is that there's no water there to, um, to take the carbon dioxide out of it. But also on Venus, there's no real strong evidence for plate tectonics, although there is internal activity. No evidence for continental oceanic crust, although there is evidence for mantle plume activity. So uh, what I want to do now is move to Earth. That's having sort of contrasted the Venus and Earth. I'm going to concentrate on that difference now and really come back to Earth and, and really think about the planet that we know and a bit of plate tectonics that all the Earth scientists in the room love. Um, and we're very familiar with these sorts of diagrams. Uh, this one's summarising from the USGS, really quite aged now, mid-ocean mid ridges, spreading centres, 
doing this, as we can see, producing volcanic, volcanic rock, producing new ocean crust and lithosphere that moves away down through underneath, beneath the oceans, then eventually gravity takes over and it sinks down back into the mantle. And, uh, and then we get, uh, we get uh, volcanic rocks produced at island arcs. And then the ocean fracture zones, the transform boundaries, which uh, this, is, this is actually an open university diagram, uh, which expose the lower parts in, the, in these, um, in these uh, scarps here, expose the lower parts of the oceanic crust and mantle uh, to infiltration by the ocean. What, um, what the, and the, these are, as I say, these are all very familiar diagrams. Um, but what they tend to do is ignore the fact that most of this action is happening underwater. And you can superimpose on that also the uh, examples of what goes on at mid-ocean ridges where the seawater the sea sinks down into the crust and then is recirculated back up. It heats up and then gets recirculated back into the ocean, forming these wonderful things, uh, black smokers, which are heavily mineralized and then... Uh, really help balance the composition of the, or really dom dominate the balance of the composition of the oceans. And then of course at subduction zones, all this material that has been well and truly hydrated by the oceans gets subducted and a lot of water is released and that triggers melting in here and that water eventually finds its way into the mag or it is, is concentrated by the magma into volcanoes and produces these very violent eruptions at in, in, in places such as uh, Chile and Indonesia that hit the news regularly. But the important thing, one of the other things that is, less, is uh, less talked about is that when you go to these ocean fracture zones and you do a good bit of dredging with your, with, with your uh, research vessel, you pull up an enormous amount of this material, which is serpentine. And if you go down to the lizard in Cornwall, uh, uh, then you'll find that where, where you have a section of the Earth's, uh, a sample of the Earth's mantle, you'll find it's dominated by serpentine. And this stuff has up to 13% water in it. Uh, there are other minerals like talc and so forth. They're all magnesium, mag hydrous magnesium silicates. And these actually form an important component of the plate composition and structure. So the first di we're, many, many will be familiar with these sorts of diagrams which show the overall structure of an oceanic plate with the sediments on the top there, pillow lavas, sheeted dike complex, and then down into gabbros uh, and whirlites in the mantle, and then peridotite, Hartsburgite, peridotite, and gabbros down here uh, in the mantle section. So this, and th this is all an extremely anhydrous igneous petrology view of the structure of the oceanic lithosphere. When you look at it from a, a point of view of, of looking at the alteration, which is one of the dominant features of these sections, we find that, this, that the upper level, the laves and the dikes, can be 50% altered and have 2% water in them. The gabbros can also be altered and have up to half a percent. And then down in the mantle section, you end up with these... Um, uh, serpentinites uh, and, and talc-rich rocks, which have, well, they can have up to 10% water in them. So the oceanic crust that forms, that forms at the ocean ridge moves along under the ocean basin and is subducted, is taking down a lot of water with it. <coughs> so what happens to these plates as they get subducted? And there are, this, is, this is an example from, of some seismic tomography of the uh, Tonga Arc in the south, southwest Pacific. This, for the reference, this is uh, New Zealand down here. This is the Kermadec, Kermadec Arc and then the Tonga Arc, the Lao Basin. This is Fiji and then a few islands in the, in the island arc. And this section is shown here. And this is a plot of depth uh, versus uh, distance, roughly, I think, one to one. And the colors are, represent the P wave seismic velocity. So this is, this is a, a, using seismic tomography, which is like a CAT scan on the human body. Uh, and the blue colors are, represent seismically fast material, which is the subducting plate. And then the red under these uh, shallow levels where it's volcanically active, uh, are seismically slow, and that's where it is hot. So this is very 
really very clear evidence of the way of the fact that uh, the um, ocean plates are subducted and are cycled back into the mantle. Okay, and going back to this diagram, so the subduction returns, returns the water, the sediments and the water back into the mantle. They get dehydration here. This, this migrates up into this wedge of mantle above the subductive slab. This melts and that produces the volcanic, the volcanic front. Okay, that's all fairly well established. But when you look uh, this, uh, at more recent work on the same part, and this is uh, the slightly, the graphics are not quite so good here, but this is Fiji, this is the, 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 the Tonga arc, and there's a line of section there, and this is going down to 2,000 kilometers now. And it actually, and this shows what we saw before, and then it takes it even further down, deeper into the mantle. And this is a section, there's New Zealand, this is <coughs> the Kermadec, this is much clearer, this is really taking this recycled, what we, what we identify as this right, recycled material, deep into the mantle. There are still provisos, and, and uh, these, these images are certainly subject to interpretation, but I think these are now widely held as, as credible views of the interior of the Earth. But the interesting question then is if, if, this, if this material is from the surface is getting this far down into the mantle, what's it actually taking with it? And this is where if, you've, if you feel a bit like a snooze and you're not too good on technical diagrams, this is when to have a five-minute nap and I'll, I'll, we'll get somebody to ring a bell to wake up. So anyway, going back to these, uh, these sub, um, serpentine, serpentinite rocks, this is this this min the experimental petrologists have subjected this to pressures and temperatures equivalent to deep in the earth. So this is a pressure down here from five gigapascals. So that's equivalent to goodness knows uh, about hundred kilometers depth down to th thirty-five seven hundred kilometers depth, and this is temperature five hundred up to fifteen hundred centigrade. So. When you subject talc, uh, sorry, um, serpentinite to uh, these sort of pressures and temperatures, you find that as the, temperature, uh, the pressure goes up, it goes through a number of phase changes as indicated by these solid lines. But each of these successive phases actually contains, con continues to contain the water. And the average of, over these phases is about this, this. This gives the water content of these phases, which is about three, three to four percent water. The white areas actually have, have are anhydrous, so there is no water in them, and they're <laughs> over there. And I'll come back to this area in a minute. The conditions in the mantle at, the, at these sorts of de depths are up here. So in the in the average mantle, this. You'll, you'll find that these, these mineral phases, these hydrous magnesium silicates, or dense hydrous magnesium silicates, as they're called, are unstable, so they can't, they can't contain the water. But if you plot the pressure temperature path of a subducting slab, it follows this line here. And as you can see, that is well within this blue field, which is where the dense hydrous magnesium silicates are stable, and this means you can transport water down to, the de down to about here, which is somewhere in the region of six, six to 700 kilometers. Right? These lines, the red lines here, are what are called dehydration lines. So when, when the conditions cross that, they release the water and you produce another mineral phase. The other interesting thing on this is that the, this area above, uh, uh, above the blue area, shaded in green and yellow, is actually the zo is, is the stability of minerals such as Wadesleyite and Ringwoodite, which are rather fancy names for different um, polymorphs of the mineral olivine, which is stable at low levels at, uh, at low pressures in the mantle. And it's found that these two still contain certain amounts of water. I mean, these are the percentages. So between between a, a half and two percent water can actually can, can be a stable part of the mantle in what's called the transition zone in, in, the, in, the, in the mantle. Okay. And there has now recently been some evidence from uh, inclusions in ultra-deep diamonds, uh, rather scrappy looking, so this is a diamond, um, rather a miserable looking thing. You wouldn't want it in your fiance's wedding ring, uh, uh, engagement ring, but it contains lots of mineralogical treasures. 
It's, about, it's, about, it's only about a millimetre across, and the, you probably can't see, but there's a little fleck in there. It's 50 microns long, and it's been identified as, an, as, as, as a small crystal of ringwoodite. Uh, the analysis of the diamonds and their inclusions from this particular location in Brazil, Junina, uh, they, uh, it's now known that some of these samples come from four or 500 kilometers depth in the mantle, in other words, from that transition zone. And this, little, this crystal of ringwoodite was found by my colleague, well, my ex-colleague Graham Pearson, now in Edmonton in Alberta, and his group, uh, they looked at it very carefully with uh, infrared spectroscopy and found that it contained about 1.5% water, which is what the phase diagram would suggest. And more recently, that was in 2014, and more recently in 2018, uh, in science, this group uh, identified another inclusion, which, again, from spectroscopy and crystallography, they identified as ICE-7, which is a high-pressure high pressure polymorph of, um, of, of ice. So there is evidence of water in the deep mantle, physical evidence, uh, but the question remains whether it's recycled or primordial, and I'm not going to even go anywhere near that at the moment. So water in the mantle, this, so when you subduct this, the, uh, the, the slab, as we call it, the, the oceanic plate, it warms up and releases bound water, migrates into the mantle, and induces melting. But it also, when it gets beyond that, We've also another, an, uh, another, another discovery is that water will actually dissolve in the nominally anhydrous minerals of the mantle, namely olivine and peroxine. And these are results from some, quite some years ago of water, the amount of water that peroxine, orthopyroxene, and olivine can accommodate against, so this is concentration, it's log scale, uh, and against depth. And see, these, at, at, at these depths in the mantle, the olivine can accommodate maybe up to 2,000 parts per million water and similarly with orthopyroxene. And these are the dominant minerals in the mantle. So water gets down there and it, and it can dissolve in the minerals within the mantle. And that importantly, and this is another very technical diagram, but just comes right on the top. This effectively shows the uh, is a strain, strain rate versus temperature and this is wet olivine and this is dry olivine, and it effectively shows that the wet olivine is about 200 times weaker. It strains more, 200 times more rapidly than dry olivine. In other words, the minerals are weakened by the presence of water. So water reduces the strength, mineral strength, and it therefore reduces the mantle viscosity. On this scale, remember, we're talking about the, the, the mantle as a fluid phase, so we consider how, how rapidly or how slowly it flows, and therefore it promotes solid-state convection, solid convection, which is what you need for plate tectonics. Water in the continental crust, and this is just briefly, also is essential for melting, and I won't go into detail here, but, uh, but if, if you have no water... Um, if, you have, if you have no water, then the crust melts at these high temperatures. If you do have water, you can hardly see that. I'm sorry for that. It melts along this blue line, so it's, it's much easier to melt. So I hope through this I've, I've given you an idea of sort of the way in which the plate interacts with water hydrothermally at mid-ocean ridges, accumulates sediments, fractures allow the water to penetrate deep down into the mantle, then it goes back into, to, deep down into the plate, which is then subducted into the mantle and partially dehydrates. I'll go to this diagram, producing partial melts, which produce volcanism. They transfer the water into the crust as well as into the atmosphere, and the water within the crust encourages melting to produce granite, which is what the continents are made of. But some of the water in these dense hydrous magnesium silicates continues down into the deep mantle, and the, and, the, and the gases of the water is eventually released and just, uh, is just taken up by the minerals that are present down there. Eventually, that material wells up underneath the oceans in mid-ocean ridges where it's outgassed and the water returns to the surface. Now, as it says at the bottom here, what happens if you take away the ocean? Well, you get no aqueous interaction with the plate. Therefore, you'd have no melting at subduction zones, and you would be very difficult to melt the crust. 
Uh, one thing I haven't gone into is that plate structure would be very different, but that's, that depends on, on the strength of olivine and, its, uh, and the solubility of water. The mantle would be much stiffer, mantle convection more sluggish. And I suggest that that would result in no plate tectonics. The lack of melting within the crust would make no continents, and as well, we'd have no sink for the CO2. So an Earth without water begins to look remarkably like Venus. So my suggestion is that the lack of water on Venus is not only responsible for its uh, inhospitable surface conditions, but it is also responsible for its lack of convincing plate tectonic features. So the hydrosphere is really very important to Earth, critical to us, dominates the rock cycle, strongly influences, I would say, determines the style of global tectonics, buffers surface temperatures by absorbing those greenhouse gases and also because of its high um, thermal time, um, its uh, high thermal capacity. It's the medium for life and that's really quite important. So just to end with how vulnerable we are to um, not being habitable, I like to use this graphic which summarizes the world's, uh, shows how much water there is on the earth. Uh, you can get this, you can find this on, if you look, just do Google the world's water, you end up on this, uh, on this site, which is, uh, I think, is USGS. Uh, the, big, the big globe there, these, these are spheres, is all the water in, on, and above the earth. That's not very big, is it? Uh, the next globe there, and it's sort of sitting primarily over Donald Trump's heartland, I don't notice. <laughs> um, this is all the liquid fresh water, that globe there. And then the little blob right by it is fresh water lakes and rivers. So that is not a great deal. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's almost a trace content of the earth. And yet it has such an influence on, on the, 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 the tectonics of the earth and on the earth's surface habitability. And just as another example, just another example of the earth's vulnerability or I feel it's vulnerability. I, I, this was an open university uh, in-text question to get students to think about orders of magnitude. Uh, so just how deep is the ocean? The abyssal plains are at a depth of five kilometers and the Atlantic, say, is 5,000 kilometers across. If we reduce the Atlantic, Atlantic to a width of five meters, and how deep is, the, how deep is that? pool of water to retain the two, two scale. And those, my son is in the audience, got a first in math, so he knows already, but for the rest of you, it's five millimeters. This is barely a film, it's not even a puddle of, uh, of, across the surface of, of, of the earth, really. So the, just to emphasize really how little water there is on the earth compared with the amount, the, 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 the size of the earth and how important it is to us. So just to end, trying to get back to plate tectonics and life, I mean, water is the, is the medium, I think, that is critical for both. And life help maintain, ma helps maintain, if, yes, this is if I were James Lovelock, I would say that life helps maintain water on the Earth's surface. So it produces oxygen through photosynthesis, which reacts with hydrogen, which is released during water-rock interaction. I mean, essentially, the uh, process of water-rock interaction is, is one of oxidation, oxidation of the rock and, uh, and dissociation of the water. And without life intervening, the, uh, um, without life intervening and producing the, the oxygen to recombine with the, with the uh, hydrogen release, the hydrogen would go into the atmosphere, and because it's so light, it would uh, eventually be um, escaped to space. And we've seen, I think, the case I'm making is water is critical to plate tectonics. So is plate tectonics a prerequisite for habitability of a planet? Or if you're James Lovelock, is plate tectonics a consequence of a planet with life? And on those philosophical thoughts, and exactly 50 minutes, I will end there. And I should put up the begging slide as well. Thank you very much. Super, Nick. Thank you very much. Okay. That was Enjoyed that. Beautifully illustrated and, uh, and, and really interesting. 
Um, there is an opportunity to ask a question or two if, uh, if people would like to do that. Uh, we have a gentleman here. Yeah. We have a microphone. But yeah, we'll provide you with a, a microphone. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, it's slightly irrelevant, what well, might be. There seems to be very little water on the Earth, yet we've had oceans, as far as I know, since the Earth pretty much began. Is there any system that's maintaining that water? Is there some sort of feedback mechanism that allows this to be controlled, or are we, are we just very lucky? Well, I think this is part of the controlling mechanism. I mean, the, 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 the suggestions are at the moment that while... And I think the, uh, the final sort of slide with the little m blue marbles of water might be somewhat out of date. There's a suggestion that the mantle actually holds three or four times the volume of the oceans in, in water. So given that the, the mantle is, has that capacity, then I think there is a, there's a system that operates over a time scale of hundreds of millions of years, which cycles the water through the, from the surface to the depth. That's really what I've been showing here. The, the reason we keep the water on the surface is partly, I think James Lovelock is right, is partly due to life, make, making sure that the surface is oxidising enough so that, the hydro, so that the water doesn't dissociate with chemical interactions and the hydrogen escape to space. And I think that's the reason why the Earth is different from Venus. I don't think that, that those conditions ever existed, or if they did, they weren't stabilised on Venus to allow to keep the water trapped. It might well be that Venus has a lot of water at depth, but, uh, but I think that, that's a point for speculation. Anybody else? Sir? Yeah, there's one here. How does water travel downwards against the geothermal gradient? It's, uh, it it seems the, to me that water would reach a supercritical point. Yep, it and does. Once it reaches that, it would uh, melt everything in sight. It before, okay, water uh, in a mid-ocean ridge environment, I mean, in quite shallow levels, when the water, the, the these are tectonically and volcanically active, they're highly fractured, and the water, just because they're under three kilometres of ocean depth, the water is, will push down into any crack. And it will keep on going until, as you quite rightly say, it reaches somewhere where it goes supercritical and turns, in, turns into steam. And that then circulates round back and produces the hydrothermal vents. But it also, it also interacts with the mineralogy of the rocks there, which become altered and, the lock, and locks the water into alteration products. So minerals like actinolite and, um, uh, and amphiboles and micas and so forth, not micas, but amph amph certainly amphiboles, will stabilise the water in the crust. Where, where the water can get even deeper in, in uh, transform fracture zones, deep, deeper in, where, where the crust is somewhat colder because it's a bit older, it's been around for 10 million years, it will go even deeper, interact with the mantle and produce these hydrous magnesium silicates. And those, are, as I showed you there, under high pressures and keep the temperature down, those are stable right down into the mantle. But you're quite right. I mean, that's a, it's, it's a good question to ask. An awful lot of the water in the oceans through, uh, doesn't just circulate in a relatively shallow process. Okay? Just some of it gets locked in the rocks and is taken down deep into the mantle. Thank you. Anybody else like a shot? Yeah, the gentleman at the back. Oh, we're getting... Gentleman in the red, red jumper. Uh, and then there's a chap on the left here as well. In the grey. This is possibly a stupid question, but uh, does the fact good. that wa the water is in the oceans is salty, does that make any difference? Would the situation be the same in the cycle you're talking about if it was fresh water? Uh, no, it becomes salty because... It's a, it's a, once again, it's a consequence of, of interaction with the rock. Weather, weathering, of the, uh, weathering of the continental crust essentially takes the, the crustal material into the ocean, and the only thing that stays in solution is sodium and chloride. This then will react with the, uh, with the ocean crust through hydrothermal vents and so forth, and that's, what, that's one of the processes that stops the sodium building up to, almost, to very high levels in the oceans. If you do a calculation of the flux of sodium through the world's rivers into the oceans, you end up that the, 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 the and, and this was actually a calculation done in the 
uh, 19th century to calculate the age of the Earth. Somebody said, well, the, the continents are eroding, the rivers feed the oceans, therefore, if you feed the rivers into the oceans, then the amount of sodium in the oceans compared with the rivers will give you the age of the Earth, and it turns out to be 100 million years. Uh, that we now know is wrong. But the important thing is it shows the residence time of sodium in the ocean. And so what's happening is that the composition of the ocean is controlled by weathering off of the continents and by this hydrothermal circulation at the mid-ocean ridges. Okay? So not a stupid question at all. Um, the, uh, what, I think what would happen, if it was all fresh water to begin with, it would become salty be by this interaction. Okay. Uh, it's, it's another question about water, I'm afraid. That's right, that's when what you, it's about. Um, uh, Earth seems to be the only uh, bod of the rocky body, uh, planetary bodies, that's got, got visible water at the moment. Yes. Uh, were we, were, is it possible to tell whether all of the, these rocky bodies had the same endowment of water to start with and the others just couldn't keep hold of it for one reason or another? Okay. Or if we were lucky and got struck by a, you know, a very wet meteorite or something yeah. and got yeah. an unusually no, no, large no. amount of it to start that's with? A, that's a good question. Is the water primordial or was it delivered by a comet after the, after the Earth had formed? Uh, the jury's out. I think there's no, um, there's, there, there's no real decision on that. That's, that's why spa they, uh, my colleagues at the OU like to spend, uh, send space missions to comets and so forth because they like to measure the isotopes of these uh, cometary bodies as the hydrogen and oxygen isotopes and compare them with the hydrogen and oxygen isotopes on Earth. I, that's that's the real, one of the real purposes of going to look at comets. And as far as I'm concerned, as far as I can remember, the, once again, as I say, the jury is out. The, some, some, some cometary samples, some look isotopically a bit like Earth's water, and others are very, very different. My preference, I suppose, is that the, all the planets, all the inner planets formed of roughly the same material originally, uh, that contained quite a lot of primordial water. They all went through quite um, very, uh, very, um, thermally active accretion processes, uh, but despite that, they held on to some of their volatiles. Certainly the Earth did. My talk last year referred to the presence of helium-3 in deep mantle samples, and that's in, that, that is only formed, uh, well, that's a primordial element. It's not generated within the Earth. It has to come from um, a primordial source. So if you can hold on to helium-3, you must be able to hold on to some of the water originally. So, so I think, I think there is a, a, certainly a component of the Earth's water that is primordial. There might well be a component that was delivered after the Earth formed uh, from, comet, from uh, disturbance in the Oort field and uh, comets. Hedging my bets. One last question. Our, there was a gentleman there. I just, yeah. I was just wondering how um, the situation might compare with Earth on, say, some of the Jovian moons, uh, especially like Europa. Yep. Uh, pass. There's no one about that. No, no. I think that certainly every moon, every moon they look at on, of, of the outer planets uh, is different. Each one is different from another. Some of them have ice, um, seem like frozen oceans, others like Io are volcanically very active, and that's, that's caused, that is derived from internal energy, but that's due to um, gravitational resonances with moons and the, and the mass of Jupiter. So that causes the melting there. What is going on on the other moons? I really don't know. Um, you're in a much colder part of the solar system. In the, I mean, the real, the real difference between the rocky planets and the gas giants is that the gas giants held on to their primordial volatiles. That's why they've got an awful lot of gas, right? And then, and then further out, the, um, uh, the, the, the yes, the, the gas. The, well, the composition of the gases as you go out in the solar system changes change. So, uh, uh, and the moons reflect that lack of the, those cold temperatures and the fact that uh, these gases, these gases and Ices can exist uh, uh, sort of there without being without being uh, blown away by by the by the heat by essentially by the heat of the sun. Sorry, that was a bit garbled, but it's it's about it's about the ambient temperature in the solar system, certainly during its formation and and subsequently to that. 
Okay. Well, Nick, thank you very much. That was tremendous. And thanks for your, uh, your interest and, and, and questions. Thank so, you. So, one last round of applause. For thank you. Just in oh, case. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Hello. Sorry, it was an interesting right. talk. Three very quick things. Yes. I was with you all the way through plate tectonics. So yes. That was fantastic. But I, I, if I, if I'm a fan of Lovelock. Um, oh, you're not? I am a fan. You of are, yes, yes. Uh, I, dis I disagree. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not convinced by your, your my, giving my, oxygen, um, yes. uh, retaining water for two yep. very good reasons. Yeah. Uh, reason number one uh, if water was dissociated. 